All right, Oedipus uh, part two here. Um, Aristotle said that tragedy is an imitation of an action of high importance, complete and of some amplitude, some magnitude. So it's not just any old action. It's in language enhanced by distinct and varying beauties acted, not narrated, by means of pity and fear affecting its purgation of those emotions. That's a very concise definition of tragedy. It's from book six of Poetics. It's the imitation of an action. Remember back in uh, when we looked at the Odyssey and what poor young Telemachus didn't have was any role model to imitate. It's the way we learn. Um, if you live a life off the land, it's harder to do what crazy city dwellers do, which is to live as if the rules of the world don't apply to you, because they don't. You can go work out or shop or do anything 24 hours a day. Th there's artificial lights, all that. So we've managed to break the sort of regularity, the patterns. <laughs> the problem is that we don't really fit that world very well. You know, we can create it, but we can't really live in it. So um, Aristotle's tragedy speaks to a reality about human nature, which I think still exists, but we sometimes act as if it wasn't the case. Because again, we don't see imitating other people as our way of doing things the right way. Now when I say we, I think traditional cultures are more so. Like the more traditional, the more minded you are to think that doing what your parents did is the right thing to do. But that's not what you're taught here in this country. Uh, the heroes of our movies and TV are, are orphans. So they don't have any parents. They're superheroes. I would like to have superpowers. I can imagine myself having superpowers. I enjoy this. This is a fantasy. Now how am I going to go imitate it? Well, I can't actually because I can't. I don't actually have those superpowers. So there's not much for me to imitate here. Whereas the people that we see here, like Odysseus, um, they are men who are better than we are, for sure, but they're still men. And we can recognize them. They don't have superpowers. They're mortals. They just are maybe amongst the best of men. But there's still somebody we can aspire to. We can be like them. That's the whole point of the epic, is to have examples that we admire. Same thing in tragedy, by the way. He, Aristotle says that the hero of a tragedy, or the protagonist, by the, this is the technical term, the protagonist, or the first actor, the first agent, is a person of high estate an aristocrat, a king, a nobleman, somebody that we look up to. It's an, a necessary part of a tragedy is that we look up to the person that is about to fall. And one of the reasons for that is because um, we're interested in the lives of the rich and the powerful. It's why we watch celebrities. That's why, to some degree, we were enthralled with the death of Queen Elizabeth, watched by five billion people around the world extraordinary. Most people would never have seen her in person, although a lot would have more than usual because of her worldwide uh, commonwealth duties uh, and visiting. Um, but we see that somebody who is better than us and seems happier than us, somebody who we would wish to be like, if not the, gla the, the gaze of the, the camera and being chased by the paparazzi, at least being known and admired and, and having the money and whatever that goes with that. That person, though, is necessary to a tragedy because it, 
it happens to somebody of that rank that we admire and yet that person falls and we sense how far they've fallen. And we also sense that it is a genuinely terrible fall. Whereas in comedy, the characters that we watch are usually dumb and dumber. They are people that we don't admire, that we don't look up to, but we probably look down on. And we find some amusement in doing that. But it, there's, it's both comedy and tragedy depend on human inequality, which is hard for us to imagine because our society pushes, puts all of its chips in on equality. We all want to be equal. We want to see each other as equal. We don't like the idea of inequality. We hate the idea of inequality. <coughs> and the effect of this is that we find nothing funny because if you're laughing, you're laughing down at somebody. So I'm not going to laugh. And, but we also have no sense of tragedy because we never put anyone up high enough to see them fall. Or if we do see them fall, we want them to fall because they were above us and we resented the fact that they were better than us. And we thought there was something wrong about that. We wanted them to be brought down to the same level as we are. Right? And so in the media, you see the celebrities getting attacked because they're celebrities, basically. It's hard to be up in the public eye like that. But in addition, in the climate of equality, people want to bring you down. That's not the case here. We don't want Oedipus to fall. On the contrary, we want him to succeed. I think he's a likable character. His parents seem likable characters. Jo Jocasta and Laos, what do they do wrong, per se? They don't do it. I mean, they're not morally bad people. But they do, a, they do terrible things. And it's fated that they do, but they try and escape the fate even. Who wouldn't? It shows that they are good characters. If they were Game of Thrones characters, they wouldn't care. They would be the opposite, in fact. They, the, the, the people in positions of power, responsibility, privilege would do depraved things, and we would expect that because it goes along with it, right? And so we're not even surprised at it, and if they get brought down, we're happy. There's no tragedy there. It's actually, this is great. They got what they deserved because they were bad people. That's not how Aristotle sees it, and that is not how life works. People who are in positions that they're in historically used to get there because of their abilities, their virtue, their inheritance, their family line, and so forth, and they were bred to follow that, uh, that example. I have a noble parent. He is going to teach me to be like him. And I would follow his example, right? So there's that. Very different. Yes, sir? Well, I agree with your point on what you're saying there, but are you saying that we shouldn't have these portrayals of characters in power who do corrupt things because power goes beyond the No, I am, no, because that would be um, uh, unrealistic. And, um, and also that it would... Uh, it wouldn't be instructive in any way either. The truth is that power does corrupt. Um, and that's because of something that the Greeks don't know so much about, which is the problem of human sin and the problem of gaining too much power without any checks on that. Um, but it's very easy to dismiss all greatness as somebody having abused other people to get to the top of the ladder. Those people exist. I know them personally. I have experienced bad treatment from other people um, in order to advance their own position. That's part of life, and it's not a pretty part of life. And that needs to be portrayed. But on the other hand, is there no room for genuine greatness? Because if everything is reduced down to the explanation of climbing the ladder over other people, and using them as rungs in that ladder to advance yourself, then all we are doing is diminishing good action. And do you not think that there is such thing as good action? Do you not think that there is such thing as justice? Most people do, which is why they say it's not fair. 
right? So you, you're in a conundrum there. You can't say it's unjust if you don't think it should be otherwise, and the reason you think it otherwise is because actually it is, and occasionally it is. There are people who are good people. They still have their Achilles heels, right? But, and because of those characters, we can see the tragedy of their fall. Without it, there is no sense of tragedy. Our age does not appreciate or uh, it's not even able to create tragedy in its works, the authors, because they are so cynical they don't believe that greatness is possible. But Aristotle lived in a day when there were great men that walked the earth. And they tried to produce them. And they saw it as their vocation to do that. And, uh, and so do I. That's my vocation is to make for good men, not for uh, you to get a job. I don't give a rats. I don't finish the phrase. I don't care about that per se. I think that if you're really a good person, you will get a job. But that's, I don't care about the job training. It's not my, uh, uh, I have no ability to train you for your job. Because I don't know what the job's going to be for one thing. I'm not your employer. But I can talk about character. And I can introduce you to <coughs> the lives of great individuals, and I can talk about story, as, and I can talk about how poetry uh, boils it down to very beautiful words, so that we were going to want to talk about that again and again and again and again. And my belief, because of what Aristotle says about imitation of an action, <clears throat> because human nature, it is in human nature, Aristotle further says, for us to imitate. We love imitating. He says that about human nature. Human beings, by their nature, love to imitate. If you have children, you will know this. Your little children will watch what, everything you do, and they will imitate the bad things as well as the good things. And that includes your reactions to things which you try to hide, but you couldn't because the kid was watching you the whole time. You couldn't mask your anger, your disappointment, your hurt, your whatever. Daddy, the question, think, <sighs> like when I'm outside, I can cover up, I've got a face on. When I'm with my kids, your guard's down, you're not watching that, but they're watching. So, that your character in reacting to things is, is actually exemplary as well. You're always being watched. <clears throat> if you want good kids, you have to be good. In other words, by being good, you won't necessarily get good kids. It's not like that. However, you're more likely because of imitation. <coughs> we admire people that are better than us. We want to be like them. Your children want to be like you. Yes? A hero. Better than us. And they both have awful things happen. Does the split come when one overcomes and, and one does not? Is something that cuts them down because of either a flaw, it's exposed a flaw in their character, like something they've done, an injustice that they've personally done and it has kept them down. So we have two different types of stories, two different plot lines, if you will, two different trajectories. One is both of them suffer. That's a part of life. Um, and both of them try and keep on going. In both cases, they deal with suffering admirably. But one of them, pardon me, will succeed in overcoming all the odds. The other will not. And it's not because he's not good, it's because it's fated that he not be able to overcome it. In fact, in both cases it is. Now, if you place too strong an emphasis on the fates, it deprives the story of all um, human interest. Like if they appear, appear like puppets. Of course this happened, it was fated. But that's not how the stories were told. It's as if they had real choices to make 
and the real choices that they made determine their out the outcome there. <coughs> the reason that this is a tragedy uh, is just because of a mistake. It was a fatal error. He made a mistake, but actually, it, far back deeper than that, it was fated this. The, the, the gods prophesied that this was going to happen. His parents desperately tried to avoid it happening. The son desperately tried to avoid it happening. In trying to avoid it happening, he brought it about. Something's being said about human nature here as well. Like this is talking about the ancient world when Aristotle's writing here about the Greeks, their conception of tragedy. But it applies to this very day, I think, not in the sense that we believe that everything's fated, but in the sense that we do know people who are admirable, better than us, and who have intended to do the right things, but then they're brought down by something. It's usually something they do to themselves, however. It's usually like an addiction, drugs, alcohol, whatever. Or it was something done to them, uh, which they can't get beyond. Like they're abused. And they, the abuse, they can't seem to get beyond it. And they do climb out of that pit and they manage to escape all that and they're successful, but they've never dealt with the trauma that they experienced early. And it comes back to them in the night, whatever, and they're traumatized by that and they're brought down by it ultimately. And maybe they even repeat patterns, cycles of abuse. They experienced abuse, they start abusing. They, it just, and that, that seems like it's almost fated. And I think psychologists even talk about abuse being inherited in certain ways. Aristotle is not talking about that. It wasn't something his parents did per se even. But there was, there is a sense that um, some things are not only subject to our free will. For all of the validity of our free will, it won't help us break the problem of sin. He calls it hamartia, Aristotle does. I mentioned this word last time. It's one of the four words used in the New Testament for sin, hamartia. It's an error. It's not a moral, it's not used in a moral sense. So he didn't do a morally bad thing. He's just missed the mark. It's like an arrow shooting at a target and he's missed the whole target. He didn't just miss the bullseye, he sh shot so far wide that he missed it altogether. It's whatever his flaw is, or it's his weakness of character. What's the weakness of character of Oedipus? I said it last time, he thinks he knows. Why does he think he knows? Because he can see. Oida pu. What do I see? What do I know? I, I know because I can see it. Whereas Tiresias is blind and so he can't see it, so he can't know it. That's the assumption he makes about this situation. It's a fatal error on his part. Now, it, even if he had recognized what Tiresias had said, it wouldn't have solved the problem because he's already committed the crime that needs to be punished. It's too late. But his parents at the outset could have realized they can't avoid the the will of the gods either. Remember, this is at a religious festival for Dionysus. When I say Aristotle says this about the human condition, I think Christians see it very differently than the way Aristotle presents it. And Shakespeare will present it differently. He writes tragedies based on Aristotle. He knows Aristotle. But because of Christianity, he has a different view of where how human life is to be lived and whether we are in fact fated. He happens to think, no, we're not fated to this. <coughs> Fate's blind, it's arbitrary even. It doesn't seem to be related to anything. Uh, Christians think of God's foreknowledge and providence and God is good. And there's always the possibility of repentance. Oedipus can't repent even. There's nothing he can do to undo this. There's no possibility of repentance. <coughs> He's going to get scapegoated. So he has a tragic flaw, some sort of weakness. Um, now, in, in some tragedies, not necessarily this one, um, it's, it's, but I think it is in this one, it's hubris. I'm going to write these words on the down board here. 
so that you get the right. So these are some of the fancy Greek words that Aristotle uses. I repeat them because they are used uh, in the critical vocabulary thereafter. <clears throat> like when you're trying to talk about a story and the particular feature of the story that you know, puts the term on it, <clears throat> some terms are just the best terms. You can't, there's no synonym for this. Aristotle's terms get passed on. I haven't even explained all of them yet, but some of them are well known. So hamartia, not so much. Christians maybe, other people not usually. Um, hubris is well known. Hubris is pride. Arrogance, leading to overconfidence. He's overconfident in the fact that he can solve the problem. He has this attribute, does Oedipus. And for good reason, after all, he solved the riddle of the phoenix. Aristotle also talks about catharsis. What is this? Uh, scholars are divided on this. <clears throat> I think that after witnessing a tragedy, so what it means is being purged, literally. Uh, it is used in English, some things uh, usually for purging your bowels, so you take a pur purgative, and it's sometimes called cathartic. It, it clears out, th okay. So what is being purged here? Is it just that you feel better? Well, he specifically talks about pity and fear. You're purged of pity and fear. Purged of pity towards whom? Because he, he talks about a specific function um, that catharsis fulfills. And these two emotions, if you will, or two attitudes are removed from us. Well, pity, we don't pity Oedipus anymore because he did a bad thing. And the will of the gods is to be done. And so we might have been compassionate for him. We might have sympathize with his position, but actually we're purged of that. And fear, hmm, not sure about that. Who's it for? I think it is for the audience. We're to do the will of the gods, and we don't need to be fearful because whatever the gods will is going to be done anyway. So if it's the will of the gods that we do something, we don't need to be afraid in doing the will of the gods. So again, it has a religious function. Right? This was fated. It was going to happen. If they had only accepted that this was going to happen, it would not have happened. But of course, that was part of the trick of it. Human nature doesn't want fate to overrule their will in this. But most of us are not fated to do what he did, which we're thankful for. Anagnorisis. Well, this is a very different term. Now, this is a recognition. This is a discovery. It's of it's in, this, in the case of Oedipus, it's the point when he realizes that he is the guy that did all this. It's a flash of recognition. The word uh, G-N-O in there from Gnostic, you might know. So knowledge. And it's the Anna is again. He knows again as if he knew it before and he recognizes it. An Anabaptist is somebody who baptizes more than once. Do it again, and I'll do it again. There, he recognizes, oh, I did this and this, and he connects the two. So he discovers something about his true identity. He recognized that his father, or his, that he was the child whom his mother had given over to be destroyed. 
<clears throat> once he recognizes who he is, he is going to, and there's a great deal of poetic power in this, he takes out his own eyes. Why? It's a strange reaction, in a sense. He's not following Jesus' prescript to pluck out his eyes because of what he's looking upon, right? Because he's not uh, lusting after things. It's because he can't bear to see what he's done. He can't bear to see it. That's how terrible it is. He can't look upon his children, who are his children, but he can't think of them because actually they're incestuous children. He can't even look on those nearest and dearest to him. His wife, who's his mother, takes her own life because she can't look at it. She can't deal with it. He just simply removes his own eyes, and then he goes off into exile. He has, he's blinded himself, and he's lost his throne. But he's not dead. He, we will, he will come up later in Oedipus at Colonus. Um, the reversal, peripatia, sometimes it's called just peripati, with a Y rather than IA at the end, is part of the reversal of fortunes. So a fall from happiness seems to go along with tragedy. In addition, reversal means more than that. It has the opposite effect to what Oedipus intended. He was going to find the perpetrator and punish him. Instead, he punished himself. It's a reversal. His family intended to avoid the will of the gods. They executed the will of the gods. There's a huge reversal, all sorts of reversals of expected outcomes for the characters. And we are off stage watching this are shocked at the exact way in which they do what has been fated, even though they think that they are not subject to fate, which makes us think that the gods are all powerful and who can resist them. So it, it prompts us to worship the gods. So the first messenger comes along and tends to cheer Oedipus with the partially good news that contrary to the prophecy that he would kill his, his father, his father's died of old age. Oh, that's great. My father back in Corinth, he died of old age. Then I can't kill him. That's great. Then the prophecy won't come true. He's delighted. The messenger further re reveals that Old Polybus was his father only by adoption. What? I was adopted? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, who was my father? Now he has a new dread. He, he was not wanting to kill old Polybus back in Corinth, and he fled Corinth so he wouldn't do the deed. And then he finds out he's dead. Oh, I can't kill him then, but he's not your father. What? Then who is my father? Now... Suddenly, so there are like, it's like layers being pulled away, and as each layer gets pulled away, his attempt to flee his fate is reversed, and he, we find out that he has already fulfilled his fate. And it's, it, we just have not yet got to the point where he sees it clearly, but when he sees it, the eyes come out. Now, he doesn't do it on stage, by the way, just so you know. It's done off stage, backstage. The Greeks regarded it as as vulgar and, de and debasing to the audience to observe that on stage. They thought it would actually make the audience morally worse to observe that sort of thing. I say that because modern movies are very graphic in their detail. <laughs> in uh, the Iliad, people get spears put through them, arrows put through them. It's described in the tragedies, we don't see it depicted. We, we read about it, we hear about it, that's okay, we can visualize it, we can imagine it, but to see it is in some sense, it has an, a moral effect on the people that are doing it. People who are war 
in, in war are traumatized by it. A viewer who's watching it is traumatized by what they see. They're not getting what they should get from the tragedy, which is a moral lesson. They're being made worse, not better. That's the problem. It goes back to what I said at the beginning. The Greeks believe that we are educated by example. If the examples are disgusting, bad, pornographic, whatever, we don't sit neutrally and just be entertained by it. We are affected by what we're watching. And we're changed by it for the worse. You can't remain neutral by watching pornography. It degrades you. It, it, it's degrading to the people who are uh, being filmed, and it's degrading to the watcher who's taking some sort of delight from that. Because they understand that we imitate by our nature and we imitate everything that we see, whether for good or for ill. Now, if that's true, which I believe it is just by experience and by observation, then the way to educate is to put good examples, whatever's true, what is, whatever's noble, whatever's good, in front of people and, and put that in their experience all the time, as much as I can. And the reason, and, and when somebody says, but that's not realistic because the world isn't that good, I think, but that's how it's going to become that good. That's the point. Tragedies and epics, epics are not about people that are like you and me. They're about people who are better than us. Have we met those people? No, if we did, we wouldn't be reading a story about somebody like that because we would know somebody like that. That's why we enjoy the Lord of the Rings. There is an Aragorn, there is a Frodo. Right? There's a Samwise. These are good and noble characters. Do you want to spend time with them? Yes, that's why you're watching it. Do you feel ennobled by their struggle against evil? You absolutely do. And you are furthermore ennobled by it. Yes? Whereas, if you watch Game of Thrones, you will find the exact opposite, and the effect is the exact opposite. It is the inverse of that. Because the principle of imitation or mimesis holds in both cases. Because it's part of the law of human nature. We love to imitate. Furthermore, Christians are going to add to this that they know that uh, this portrait of tragedy is not the only thing that can be said about human experience, although it is true that even good people that we admire can get brought down by the, their own actions. And they were still great. But what they did was so reprehensible that we could not fail to condemn them. But it, what they did before was great. It's usually a sports star that you might think of, or a celebrity of some sort, maybe a politician. But tragedy is the result of sin, and sin is not got the last word in people's lives. That's, so there's a, a tendency of all of life to be brought down because of sin. We know that. We've observed it. You asked the question about exposing people in positions of power. Yes, because people who are not good end up climbing the ladder, and they do so in duplicitous ways. Yes, that's part of the world, and it needs to be depicted to see how this happens, and very realistic. But it's also the case that in Shakespeare's tragedies, every bad actor is punished and killed. That's the conclusion of their tragedies. It's also the conclusion of Aristotle's tragedy. The bad guy, Oedipus, is dethroned. Right? In Shakespeare, he, they're deliberately bad. You have a Macbeth, you have an Othello, you have a King Lear who's not a bad man, but a weak man and allows terrible bad things to happen. Um, all of these bad characters uh, that operate within the context of these plays end up dead and order and justice is fulfilled and order is restored. So the overarching takeaway message from the tragedy is that justice prevails. This affirms the fundamental order of things, and it concludes that way 
invariably. As the dominant tone, right? It's got the, the evil is punished in this world, in this life. That's Shakespeare, the Christian dramatist. On the other hand, in the comedies, for all of the stuff that could go wrong and does go wrong, there's a marriage scene at the end. Always, not in Greek theater. They don't have marriage scenes at the end, but Christian comedies do because, again, that's the arc of the Bible speaking into theater. Because, again, the end of the Bible talks about a marriage between God and his people, the bride, right? And it's even there at the end of the Lord of the Rings in the movie version, not in the book, but in the movie. You've got Aragorn and Arwen, they're married in the city and so forth. It's almost a, it's, it's an overly Christian ending for the book. I'm talking about the book. In, uh, in the book, Tolkien perversely throws it in the appendix that they get married. <laughs> He couldn't have put that in the main action of the book, right? No, because Arwen wasn't really part, an important part of the story. She was more in the movies, and they get married, in that, and that's, that's sort of great. It makes us feel good. But the, the king marrying his bride, sure, that fits with, again, biblical themes. Question at the back. And I'll, yes, you're first. called The Tragedy of Romeo and Juliet. Yep. Star-crossed lovers. Both. Yeah. Well, I, as I said, the phrase, star-crossed lovers. It was fated that this should happen. It's the Capulets and the Montagues. Their houses were at war with one another. It was a potential comedy because they wanted to they, were, they loved each other and they were, they were committed to being together. They, got, they were secretly married, but in the end, they were fated to fall. There is tragedy in that. It's called a tragedy, even though there's romance as a part of it. So he's blending the genres. Now, note that we don't get that here. There's no blending. Shakespeare blends various genres, and they end, as I say, tragedies end up with bodies on the ground, and comedies end up with people getting married. And sometimes, uh, the comedies aren't very funny, and the tragedies aren't necessarily dealing with the baddest of the bad people, because Romeo and Juliet is not dealing with the baddest of the bad. They're just kids that happen to be caught between a war between two families that they would not put down the fight, and the kids ended up being the victims. It's closer to Aristotelian tragedy there in the sense that it seemed to be fated and it seems unjust. I talk about some of this when I teach Shakespeare, one of the, the Shakespeare classes we focus on this. Um, and that, that's part of this course. We look at where tragedy originates, where the epic originates, what its features are originally, and then note what happens as a consequence of Christian ideas. What do they change into? And then furthermore, once we've done that, what happens when a culture leaves the Christian adaptation of tragedy and comedy, what do we get? And I've talked about it to some degree by speaking about Game of Thrones. Or modern superhero type epics, which are not epic, they're not really even heroes. They just have powers, but we can't, we can't imitate those powers, so they're not even real role models. This is just projection. I like to imagine I'm a Hulk and have super, you know, I can hit somebody and they'll go through a wall and whatever. Yes? Um, as we're uh, speaking of the story of Oedipus, um, kind of seeing parallels with um, the story of King David and the prophet that comes to him. Like Nathan. angry. Yep. It's thank you. Yes. Um, and it illustrates exactly the point I was just making. The story of David and Bathsheba is a tragedy. We have a great man, a man who was uh, 
singled out by God for his particular zeal for him, right? This man, David, uh, loves the Lord, and the Lord loves him. And he, we had the man who looked like the king, Saul, who was not very king-like. He was a weak man. For all of his physical stature and appearance, he was a morally weak man. He, he, he tried to uh, live up to others' expectations for him. He didn't want to do the right thing for the right reasons. He ended up consulting the witch of Endor and all this, so like trying to kill it like he was a... He was not meant for power. He didn't have the character for it. But David, the opposite. He was humble, didn't try to take vengeance in his own hands, um, didn't even want to uh, kill Saul when he had the opportunity to do so, when Saul would have killed him. Did the right thing. But with Bathsheba, he did the exact opposite of his character even. He didn't go out to battle. The, his nation had gone to war. Why isn't David there? He's always there. He's decided to stay at home. What's with that? We don't, we don't exactly know why, but we know it's not normal for him to do that. Something is suggested in the text, but it's not explicitly said. He's noticed Bathsheba. When, where, how, who knows? I mean, it's, um, her, her uh, husband is Uriah, Uriah the Hittite, right? He's not even an Israelite, but he's fighting in the army. And who knows, there are gatherings of the generals, the noble, maybe he's seen her, maybe along with him, and thought, oh, I like the look of her, whatever. Who knows? Not, not even clear. But he does stay behind, and he sees her bathing. Well, how does he see her bathing? Like, they got walls, right? Well, because she's up on the rooftop bathing. So is she not putting herself out there on the rooftop? A little bit of complexity there in the story. Because how does a man in a house see a woman bathing uh, unless she's out, in well, she's out in public? But he's, because he's a king, he's probably in a higher place and he's looking and he stays out there to be the peeping Tom. I don't know exactly. But he's put himself in the position to do there by not being the man that he was before. He's just, maybe he's tired, maybe he's who knows what, but he's in that position. He commits the act of adultery and then adds to it by trying to cover it and tells his army, is it Joab? I can't remember who's the head of the army at that point, if it's Joab, but he tells him basically, charge with the Israelite army, call the charge, and then tell the man to stand back and let Uriah go forward. And he'll just get mowed down, right? And Uriah being the brave soldier is assuming that everyone's with him and then he notices they're all behind and <laughs> cut him down. So he commits murder, but it will never be known that it's murder because it happened in battle. In the, in the, the, now the men in the army are going to know, presumably, but the order came from Joab. Anyway, so he's going to get away with it. Because he didn't get rid of the man. It happened in battle. We know it. And of course, we know that God know, knows it as well. That's the thing. We already know what God's standards are on adultery and on murder and all that. So we know this is a bad act that David has done. It's not like David at all. In that sense, it's tragic. He's committed a hamartia, except it's, it's clearly a transgression and it's a known transgression at that. He's done a very bad thing. But he's going to get away with it because he's in the position of power and privilege, which he's earned. And what happens then? God sends a prophet, this time Nathan, and he tells him a story. And the story is one that he recognizes the characters in it. There's the unjust ruler, and then there's the little guy who just happens to have a lamb, and that's all he's got. He's a little man, a little farmer with a lamb, and the big man comes along and says, give me your sheep. I'm going to take it, kills it, whatever. David is outraged. Why? Because the pattern of imitation holds. He understands the resemblance of this story to his life. If we did not imitate other people, the story would have no power. It wouldn't work. But he is, not only recognizes it, he judges rightly that this is an atrocity. What he didn't realize while the story was being told was that the story was about him. And then Nathan says, 
you're the man that you're angry at. And then, how does he respond to it? Note that here, uh, Tiresias said, you're the man, early on. He said, you d you're the one who brought this curse on us. And he abused the prophet, he said, you're not telling the truth. David immediately recognizes, how did he not see it before? He immediately recognizes that he's sinned, and he tries to atone for it. He tries, but he can't. He does in one sense. He does everything he can, but he can't undo it because he has a child with Bathsheba, Solomon. The other brothers from a different woman are angry about this, and an interfamilial dynamic comes up where it brings civil war into David's kingdom. So that one act brings out and it creates an entire civil war and it brings down David as the great king of Israel. It's absolutely like it, but note how the story is used. So absolutely, it is true of human nature, what Aristotle is observing here. And we can add to it that it can be done deliberately. In which case, you might say we don't feel as sorry for him and in a sense, we don't. I don't think we feel sorry for David for having done such a terrible thing that he gets punished for it. I think we think, no, you've got what you deserve. But there is a sense of tragedy that a man who was so exemplary should have such terrible consequences. And it's saying something about the responsibilities of leadership then as well. But it's also saying something that goes beyond what Aristotle's concept of tragedy says, which is that all of these good models of what a good king could be like are never fulfilled by human beings, but there is one who will be like David, right? And he does do those things. So these are, again, by imitation, the example of a king after a king after a king, even the best of kings doesn't measure up to this, but by comparison, by imitation, we can see that one does. Without the foregoing stories, the story of Jesus doesn't jump out at us. And then it does, it jumps out at us. The humility, the greatness, this is God. Remember, this is not, he didn't, David began as a shepherd's son. Jesus began as a carpenter's son, but he also began as the son of God. So there's, again, the huge tension there. They greet him as a conquering king, you know, shouting Hosanna as he walks in to the city on the colt, you know, Hosanna, which is a taunt song to the Romans, which means the Messiah is coming and we're about to drive you Roman bastards out of here. We're going to, you know, we're going to kill you all and we're going to knock, right? That's what they think he's coming in. He's a king and he's going to bring his swords out and we're all going to fight for him and you Romans are going to die. And then they see him captured, humiliated, and the crowd is so furious with him they want him dead within a week. So huge reversals. Note the peripatia in, in these stories. Expectation, reversal, expectation, reversal. The reversal and the power of the reversal depends on the expectation rec being recognizable by the audience. For it to be recognized, action has to have a certain pattern. So this is what I said before we even started the camera. Patterns matter in your life, establish patterns of order. Jordan Peterson's making a whole career on teaching you to live an orderly life. Extraordinary. Older guys like me say, like, what has he said that's not common sense? Except that the younger generation have never been taught that. Do the right thing. Do the best thing. It's never not risky to do the right thing. But by not doing the right thing, you might be undergoing an even greater risk than the one that you realize that you're getting into by doing the right thing, which is you're gonna make somebody angry by doing the right thing. But if you don't do it, maybe the consequences which you don't see will be even far worse. So do the right thing. I think this is great advice. You don't have to be a Christian to give the advice, and he isn't a Christian or at least by his own, he says, no, he doesn't believe in God. Doesn't believe that Jesus is uh, God. But still think there's power in the biblical stories, and, and there is. 
he's correct with that. So other comments or questions here, it's, it's really extraordinary. It's the reversal, it's the patterns, it's the expectations. Um, and then there's the idea that comes out of this tragedy that we are doomed then. If a man like Oedipus, as good as he was, can end as badly as he does, then what hope do we have? That's not how the play ends. It, Oedipus does not curse God and die. Right? That, that's not the, you might expect that, given the fact that it was fated, he would just say, okay, um, life is not worth living then, I'm gonna take my own life. He doesn't do that. He walks off the stage blinded. So it's not a cursing of existence. It's more of an acceptance. So he accepts the will of the gods. He prays for blessings upon his children and he prepares to endure his exile. And that's exemplary for the Greek audience to accept the will of the gods. But it's not raging against the fated nature of human existence. It's just accepting that the will of the gods will be done. It's accepting that suffering comes in life, and sometimes you don't deserve it. Powerful stuff. Powerful stuff because everyone talks about this stuff. You've, we've all been taught to be snowflakes, not deal with any adversity, we'll deal with every problem, etc. stuff. This is saying the exact opposite. Suffering is going to come, and you are going to have to deal with it, and it will help you to have examples in how to deal with it. It does seem like Oedipus gets worse than he deserves. But he still takes it. And walks away from it. Right, there's a follow-up to this, it's called Oedipus at, at uh, Colonus. I uh, won't get into that, it's not as good a play as this, but still, it's interesting. Do you have any comments or questions about this or about the themes from Oedipus? I think Aristotle is very helpful on this. It's really extraordinary that one of the great philosophers who ever lived, if not the greatest, um, writes about poetry. He thinks it's a significant, so significant that he should dedicate a whole volume to it. He also talks about rhetoric. He says that poetry has some of the same features as philosophy. It looks at the good. And yet it does it in a way that history does not. It doesn't tell us what happened. It tells us what ought to have happened in that sense. It's talking about idealized forms of things, like the tragedy. Here's a life better than ours. Let's look at that. The epic le to looks at a life better than ours. Let's, let's look at that. And it has a, literature has a moral function then which I still think it does. It's just by watching contemporary literature uh, played out in films and TV, you might not think that it has any function other than just to keep you distracted for two hours. Because it doesn't seem to teach you much about anything. But it does, it does. It, so if it ends in chaos, without order being established, it teaches you something about reality, which is that it's chaotic, it's random, there's no meaning, there's no purpose, etc. That's, act that's actually a take-home lesson. If you're repeatedly subjected to the same chaos on screen, uh, you will believe that's the way the world is. The uh, Greek poets were regarded as teachers, 
Shakespeare was regarded himself as a teacher in his drama, and they were right in seeing it so. So don't buy the uh, lines from film writers that I'm not here to teach anything, I'm here just to entertain people. That's not an option open to you. You, you are here to entertain us, to delight us, but you are always teaching. It goes with it. And the reason why they don't want to say it is is because they don't want to be censored, which I understand. But that doesn't mean that they're right in saying that there ought to be no censorship. Not that there should be somebody who's in, in the office of a censor. That's, these are then other questions. But ought there to be good, beautiful, virtuous things presented before us? Yes, there ought to be. Ought we to see that bad, licentious, wicked things are regarded as wicked and seen to be defeated, punished, etc. Ought we to see that? In some ways, in, in all of its complexity, we ought to. What do we call those that mix those things together and see them as basically the same side of the coin, uh, where, the light, where our heroes are all dark knights? Right? He's the hero, but he uses bad means. There's a darkness to the hero. Uh, all the heroes are bad knights, including Galadriel in the you know, Rings of Power series. She's just not likable at all. It's just woman power. <sighs> silly. All the male characters are despicable and dislikable, and she's not very likable. She's just stronger than they are. Oh, great. Oh, who cares? Yeah. So are you saying... Of course you do. Seeing, so yeah, yeah, sure. uh, and I'm not so commenting on you because I don't know you, but yes, yeah, I like it as well. Yeah, yeah because it's, it, in some ways, can sometimes be taken as humanizing our heroes, also, mm-hmm. right? We mm-hmm. put ourselves in their shoes as mm-hmm. figures because we have shortcomings, mm-hmm. right? And so mm-hmm. it helps to see them. Like, that's why I've always had a problem with someone like Superman, right? I can't relate to him in any sense whatsoever. He's just this old Yeah, I don't like power, Superman right? at all. There's nothing human about him, so I don't like him. Whereas I like Batman. Whereas I like Batman or Spider-Man, someone who has yeah. very real problems that yes. can deal with that can understand yes. the thought process yes. behind it, right? Agreed. So I would say there's value in that conversation. Yes. Um, and, and also you're going to agree with da- David as an example. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and we could name others. Oedipus. Mm-hmm. Odysseus. But note that they were better. What, in what sense were they better? Were they better in the sense that they were stronger? No, it was in the sense they were morally superior. That's what we don't in, can get in contemporary superhero fiction. There's no sense that Batman is morally superior to us. He's just a billionaire, and he's a playboy, and whatever, and he's an orphan. Again, I, I talk about that, and I think that it's not insignificant that these are all orphans. They're all orphans, and orphans have no one to imitate. And in a sense, it's saying to the audience, be like this guy. But what does this guy act like? Well, he does what he thinks is right in his own eyes. Is that really a good model for somebody to live their life, thinking that there are no guardrails or there's no pitfalls in life, that all you need is enough wealth and power and whatever, and then you don't go down those dark paths. I I think it's unrealistic. It's not helpful to most people. In fact, it's positively harmful. I would agree with you in that fact of like, they don't have a good basis for more ideas coming from. Well, they're heroes, but there are examples then. So how can somebody be an example that we can't identify with? That's the problem. Fair. Right? But you're right about, I like this character and I hate Superman because of this. Right? But I would say they, they do in some ways show I love Batman. Yeah, he also doesn't want to, he doesn't want guns. He's not going to fight with guns either, right? Which is sort of odd, but. <laughs> but he also chose to leave his rich, or uh, like not to just live in his rich life in luxury, to sacrifice that 
uh, and it's nice always to help people in need also, right? So there is still some... Yeah, no, he, he takes, uh, he puts on a cape to protect his loved ones and lives a sort of a dual life. He's, he's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I'm going to do that next semester. He's got an upstairs life and a downstairs life. The, the upstairs life is he's the playboy millionaire who's irresponsible and everyone's like, ah, you know, Bruce Wayne, whatever, right? He's not, and then at night, he's Mr. Morality, but actually he does it through the darkness by going around justice to do justice. There, that's a certain model of heroism that is called Byronic heroism. It's a romantic invention. I, we'll get to that later in the course. It's not here in this era because they don't see a disconnect between public justice and private justice, whereas the Dark Knight does. He's going to be a vigilante. Others even call him that, and that's because he is. <laughs> so do I just have to have enough money and then I can do justice? Like, do I have to be Bill Gates before I can do justice? And I'll do it by whatever means comes into my head. You know, I can buy up all the farmland in the US and <laughs> whatever, and, and do and, and orchestrate events and think I'm doing the right thing. Um, even if the public won't agree with it, that's what I'm supposed to do. Is that really the role model that we want for behavior? Or is it something that is going to fit with it with justice in general, publicly accountable, like justice ought to be justice. It's always justice. Batman actually doesn't do justice. Or he sort of does, but he does it through vigilantism. Is that really a good model? I, I don't think so. But then we get into complexity there, and I, I'm saying I, I actually love Batman. I think he's great as, as one of these characters, and I used to love Spider-Man. And then and I get, after you, get a certain age, then he's just annoying. Because he's a teenager and stuff like that. And he's got all that teenage stuff. And I'm like, OK, that was sort of embarrassing, wasn't it? Why did I ever like that? Because oh, I guess I was like that. And, uh, anyway. Uh, did you comment? No, you just asked him that question. I did. No, he lives in his aunt's house in a, an apartment in Manhattan or wherever it is. Right. Right. With great power comes great responsibility. There's, right? That's the phrase. But note how he, note in those cases, all those cases, the power has nothing to do with their moral character. It has to do with their power, with their wealth, or like a spider's bite, a radioactive spider's bite, or being dosed with radiation like the Hulk or who knows what. Or having the means, the money, to buy super stuff like Batman, like you've got the, the best technology. Same with Iron Man, right? But is the moral character of the man a part of super, superhero heroism? The answer is no. So they, they separate power from virtue. And this is a problem. Because we can't separate power from virtue. Unless we give ourselves over to technology as the solution to all of our problems, which we do. And that's part of the problem of modern superhero fiction, is it, it pushes us into thinking we just have to give more power to the people with technology, and they will solve our problems, because that's what they do. And no, you disagree with me or disagree with that? Good. I have no problem with disagreement. You're talking about the superheroes now. But I'm talking about the tech billionaires. The tech billionaires, yeah. 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 You don't have to be morally virtuous to make a lot of money. You don't. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that they're virtuous because they're it doesn't virtuous. mean that they aren't either, you're right. It doesn't mean that they aren't. And they have to be have good habits. They have to be pretty smart, they have to be probably pretty lucky, and they probably had to work hard. And they had to have they had to have very strong 
attributes in certain areas. Like they had to be very bright and they had to work hard and they had to recognize talent and they had to, right? They had to have certain ability for sure. But those aren't the same as moral virtues, right? So they, they might have them, but they weren't necessary to get in that position. Whereas a hero in the ancient world would have to have moral virtues to get into that position, or at least those are the ones that are presented to us. Oedipus is a man of moral virtue. Odysseus, especially so. We saw Odysseus. This is a great man, right? It's his moral virtue that's presented to us. David is, a, is an excellent man in every sense. He, did, well, he wasn't born a king, but when he became a king, everyone thought, this is great. What a man to become a king. Oh, this is who you want to be in the position of being a king. Please. Yeah, just that idea of you know, a hero either being the hero that is a hero because he takes down the worst people or a hero that's a hero because he does better than those than others. Good point. So there are different ways of being virtuous. One is by beating up villains. Another is by be, becoming better and pursuing that. Do any of the superheroes pursue excellence, holiness, beauty, goodness? Are, they, are any of them? Do they even talk about that? No. Goodness is seen only in beating down badness. <coughs> That seems, it's a very limited portrait. Yes? Well, I, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, but go ahead and then. You know, what? Go ahead. Okay, then please, at the back. No, no, no. They're not your heroes. They're celebrities of sorts, right? Yeah. So tech billionaires are celebrities of sorts because you actually know their names. As soon as you know their names, then they're, by virtue of that, celebrities. You look up them, they're... Um, so two things. I, I wasn't saying that we regard them as superheroes like Batman, Superman. I wasn't saying that. I was saying that the modern-day superhero gets that power not through character. They get that power through some sort of weird accident like being bitten by a radioactive spider or coming from Krypton and you know the Earth's sun and, or some sort of something. Or the X-Men, there's some sort of a genetic thing that goes wrong and they have these powers then and okay, so but they have extent, they're, they're, they're superhuman in their powers. The way in which we can imagine ourselves to be that is through technology. How can you speak to somebody on the other side of the world, see somebody on the other side of the floor, will you whip out your phone, right? So technology gives us those powers. And in general, the, the whole message of, of modern superhero fiction is that technology will allow us to deal with all the problems of human nature. We don't need virtue, we just need better tech, right? Because that's what the superheroes had. They just had better tech. We can, if you're a billionaire superhero like Batman, you just have better tech, you have more money, you can buy better stuff, and that will allow you to beat your enemies down. In addition, you can train with the League of Shadows and do that sort of stuff, but whatever. <laughs> but it's, it's the tech, so it's the, there's a belief in technology to deliver us from the problem of human nature. The old way of looking at heroism is no technology is gonna deliver you from the problem of human nature. Virtue alone will help you in that uh, and that's not part of modern stories. That's all I'm observing. Modern stories do not promote virtue as a way of making you live a better life. They do promote becoming wealthier 
and using the most progressive technology as a way of living a better life. If you're Spider-Man, you get bitten, you still have to come up with the web shooters and all that. You're, you've got clever ways of dealing with the world. It's pushing the technology and those that push the technology as the solution to the problems that they all talk about, which is sin, crime, etc. So that's the point, if, okay? Really interesting. Just to note the difference. <laughs> and then the question is that you end up asking yourself at the end of all this is which is more realistic for me sitting in the seat, reading this book, will I do better in my life by getting money and the technology, which is what everyone thinks, or will it be by living a more virtuous life, seeking good, true, beautiful things and, and, and pursuing those things? Will that have a better effect down the road? Well, the jury's out, but I, I, I think it's the latter. That's what I think education is is to encourage that, and I think the witness of human history will, t will tell that as well. And if you don't think that, then you think that, the, that the, the good guys beat the bad guys by having better technology, and the only difference between the good and the bad was better technology. So what's the difference between the good guys and the bad guys then? One guy won. Okay, well then how come they're not the bad guys? No? Like, why is it just? Why is it better? Why are, we, why are we on the good guy's side? We're on the winning side. That's not the good guy's side. There has to be something that makes us the good guys, and it's not the better technology. That doesn't make for the good guys. I mean, I'm here to provoke thought, let you to think about the topics. I think they arise out of the material. Uh, next time, we will move on to uh, Virgil's Aeneid, where we'll get a second epic, this time written by a Roman.